So our uh, uh, second panel is on higher education ranking. And we have our distinguished uh, panel, uh, Mr. Ashwin Fernandez from uh, QS, and Mr. Will Sanchez uh, from Times Higher Education, and Mr. Yahya Isa from uh, Elsevier. Uh, also, as the, the previous panel, we will start by a short presentation from each one of them, and then we'll open the, uh, the floor for discussion. And uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Ashwin Fernandez. And uh, he will speak to us about the QS ranking. Uh, uh, we will start and then they will come. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Ashwin, how can, as Dr. Uh, Johansson say, how can we compare apples with oranges? Sometimes in the same ranking, you are comparing a university like uh, Cairo University, for example, which is 200,000 students about uh, 20 plus thousand faculty and uh, about 20 uh, plus faculties with a small university, maybe private university like Future or, or like uh, AUC with few thousand students and few, less than few hundreds of professors, is these are apples with apples, or apples with oranges, or uh, apples with, uh, with watermelon. <laughs> okay, so the floor is yours. All right, a very good afternoon to everyone. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank our host, AUC, for organizing this, uh, this uh, conference and to put both uh, um, you know, accreditation and rankings on the same day and discuss this important topic, whether it's accreditation or rankings. I've already made my facts known. Uh, they they complement each other, and uh, they are not supposed to replace each other, definitely. So with that, uh, I have a few slides which shows you, will show you a little bit about QS. Uh, I represent three important regions, Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia for QS, so all the familiar faces. Um, it's great to be here. And for those who I haven't met before, please do uh, reach out and share cards so we can at least keep you informed of all the other activities which happen in the region and even outside the region related to QS. Our mission at QS is to enable motivated people around the world to fulfill their potential by fostering international mobility, educational achievement, and career development. If you're wondering what the Q in QS stands for, it's the name of our founder, Nunzio Quacarelli, and the second founder, Matt Simmons. So it's Quacarelli Simmons. A lot of people think that it is the uh, Q in the, a lot of the quality assurance systems which you see. So again, uh, while we are not uh, uh, while we are not a national quality assurance uh, model, we do have Q in our name. So I think that should satisfy a lot of people who are looking for quality assurance or quality standards. Uh, we started off in 1990 at the Wharton School. Uh, today we employ 500 staff members speaking 40 plus languages uh, at offices around the world. Um, we, we have offices right from the east coast of the US to the west coast of Japan. Definitely rankings is something we do, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. We also run uh, the rating system called QS Stars, which is very similar to institutional accreditation. Uh, and um, our rankings are approved by IREG. IREG is an international rankings expert group based in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, it is a watchdog agency which makes sure that rankings are compiled professionally and transparently, and to get the approval means that we have undergone a thorough process, like an accreditation process, which, which tells you that uh, we have uh, met the requirements 
requirements for being a, a ranking agency which is transparent. Ra our rankings, besides um, you know a lot of other international agencies, some prominent ones here, which reference QS, I think even in Egypt and in the, the uh, Arab region, the QS rankings are used for various purposes, and I think uh, we can talk about it uh, you know more during a detailed presentation. Uh, the audience for QS rankings are, are, pros pr are primarily prospective international students who want to know where do, do they want to go and study. And when I say international, uh, it was while we initially started off our global rankings. Now we have national level students, we have uh, regional students, we have everyone looking at rankings, including academics, prospective partners, scholarship providers, current students, employers, university leaders, government, and alumni. Uh, one important fact that sets QS apart from uh, probably the crowd is that our scholarship fund, which funds approximately 1.2 to 1.6 million US dollars every year, which is uh, to a conduit for scholarships uh, which are offered by universities, as well as our own profit going back into, uh, into, into the QS Education Trust. So we fund postgraduate studies for students across the world who would like to go and pursue uh, different master's programs. The policy influence of QS is clearly seen across the world. Uh, here are some of the countries which reference it publicly uh, through immigration, through public policy, through uh, various other documents, either it is the top universities or the uh, excellence projects across countries. So it's not very clear on that one, I suppose, but yeah, you can see it here. Uh, and there are several other countries which reference it uh, in various other means and forms. The QS ranking impact, uh, latest statistics, 70 million visitors annually, about 150 million visitors uh, through our various platforms. So one of the most um, referenced rankings to these numbers, I can say. So I would like to make a statement here before uh, you know, we go ahead and i show you a little bit more about the difference between rankings, ratings, accreditation, is that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And this is what was happening in the region a, a while back. A lot of institutions felt they were great, they were good, but when we brought in the rankings, it actually broke the myth of a lot of institutions. While uh, you know, we are looking at the, really the top institutions which are good in research, in excellence, in, uh, in various forms, uh, we just add the data to this um, to this opinion here, which means it becomes a fact. So I'm going to touch upon, and this is a slide we prepared for rankings and ratings, uh, but it's very relevant for rankings and accreditation as well. Uh, so definitely rankings are based on relative performance, whereas ratings are, or accreditation are inclusive and adapt adaptive. Uh, it creates a hierarchical list, and definitely uh, it does not set the standard of who should get what, but it does uh, depend on who is the best and everybody else is scaled down, whereas ratings are a global standard, it's a minimum standard. Uh, it changes every year, but definitely rankings are produced uh, uh, every year in different times of the year, depending on which ra ranking you're looking at. And uh, ratings are for a fixed term, maybe three, four or five years. Um, Rankings does have limited indicators, I have to admit that, whereas ratings or accreditation looks at much beyond uh, the few six or seven parameters. Uh, it definitely favors research uh, in rankings, whereas there's a lower emphasis on research in some of the uh, ratings or, um, or uh, accreditations. Uh, rankings are a public service, and I think there was one a fact in uh, Dr. Johannan's slide, we said uh, competitive business, uh, whereas rankings directly, there is no service fee or charges for this, but definitely accreditation, ratings uh, do charge a service fee. Now, the rankings in the world today are, definitely we have THE with us, QS and Shanghai and several other rankings, but ratings, accreditations, you have QS stars, you have the UK's REF, the TEF, and we have ASCSB here as well today, and ABET and several other uh, people in, in, the, uh, in, this, um, in this basket. But this is just a general comparison. I'm not trying to say that this is exactly what accreditation or rankings are. But definitely my point is that accreditation aims for an institution to meet minimum standards. It does not tell you that you have to 
go higher than that. Whereas rankings actually does not set the bar there for you. A, a true ranking, it will tell you aim for the sky and whoever is the best will take it down, take it from there and scale it down from there. But having said that, we complement each other, I believe. And that's what happens is that rankings and accreditation are a key to us establishing the way forward for institutions. So definitely I know that in our business school rankings, we reference ASCSB, we reference uh, uh, as several other global accreditations if you would like to even participate in the business school ranking. So that's how we are working together with accreditation. Uh, a lot of people ask us, why don't we look at national accreditation in the global rankings? And while there is no single standard available globally as an institutional accreditation, it would be tough to do so. But we are, uh, we are looking at this and we are definitely working together. So when it was, uh, when the, I seen the slide, ranking or, or accreditation or rankings, definitely, uh, you know, it's a happy marriage, I think so. So please don't try to break it, yeah? Uh, so I think we, we, are, we, are, we are definitely working together. Uh, so essentially, all models are wrong. And this is what I would like to uh, say from George Box that, you know, uh, not all rankings, not all uh, accreditations are good for all types of institution, but some are useful. So definitely, uh, I, I pitch QS as a useful model for you, for Egyptian universities, to adopt this and work uh, forward. Uh, quickly, I mean, there is so much to talk about the, the criteria, but I would like to just very quickly show you how do we select institutions to feature in our rankings. First and foremost, you need to offer both undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Uh, you need to have successful batches passed out. <coughs> so uh, for, ex for the matter, you all have heard about KAUST in Saudi Arabia. They are a single, fac a single um, level institution. They only offer uh, postgraduate courses, so they don't qualify in our rankings. Um, you also need to have two of these broad five faculty areas. So if you're a single faculty institution, if you're only a business school, you don't qualify in our world or Arab region ranking, but you would qualify in a subject rankings or in the business school rankings if you are a single faculty business school uh, level institution or a medical school or um, a social science or a humanity school. So we, we look at broad um, faculty areas, at least two of this five. But that doesn't mean that all institutions that submit data are ranked. Uh, we go through our own process, we collect data from our own sources as well, and only 1,100 in the world and 130 in the Arab region are uh, ranked in our ranking. A quick clarification, a lot of people have confusion on, um, on the numbering. So this year, uh, two days ago, uh, three days ago, we released the Arab region 2020 ranking, and we have numbered it the 2020 ranking, but actually it was released this year. So think of it like the car model you buy, you definitely buy it for, it's a, it's a, more, it's a future model you're, you're getting it, so it has a longer shelf life. Yeah, so uh, definitely, uh, just to clarify that a lot of people say, well, we see the 2019 rankings, but you know, if something is wrong and your email says something else, but what we do is the 2020 rankings actually come out this year uh, for the next year, all right? So uh, the methodology, extremely quickly, because I think we have got limited time and we would like to uh, facilitate discussions. So we have academic reputation, 30%, employer reputation, 20%, faculty student ratio, 15%, web impact, 5%, papers per faculty from Scopus, uh, 5%, uh, citations per paper, 5%, uh, faculty with PhD, 5%, 2.5% for international faculty, 2.5% for international students, and 10% for international research network. So this is a nutshell, all the uh, methodology put together. We can argue that why 30%, why not 20%, why uh, reputation, why not some other data. But this has worked, and I think uh, the point I would like to make is that we have a consistent, simple methodology which has produced stable results for the last many years. Definitely is discipline independent. And I seen a point earlier today that we said, you know, rankings do favor uh, uh, technology and uh, sciences, but that's not the case with QS rankings. It's language uh, independent, so we have several uh, institutions which have strong Arabic or Sharia or uh, we can look in, in, um, in Chinese language as well, which feature in QS ranking because of the reputation component. <coughs> and definitely has a low dependence on self-reporting. 
So this is another point we can argue about as well because institutions every year come to us and say, well, we have dropped this year, can we opt out? Uh, unfortunately, the rankings are not meant, or our rankings are not meant for, stu uh, for institutions, they're meant for students. So we have an obligation, we have a duty to produce these rankings, and most of the data is available in the public domain. So this was three days ago. Um, a lot of, uh, we have at least five, six Egyptian universities which came to Dubai in the presence of the Minister of Higher Education, uh, Dr. Al Falasi, and uh, the CA, and our accreditation, the CA director was there as well. So 41 Arab institutions celebrated their rank, and uh, it's, it's a great moment for us because there's great acceptance for the Arab region ranking here today, and I hope the number of Egyptian universities in the ranking will increase in, uh, in the coming times. Uh, the top 10 of the region, definitely we have a new number one in the Arab region this year, King Abdul Aziz University, followed by AUB, uh, which has been a consistent two, uh, and uh, a few other institutions there. You can see the, the names, King Fahad as well. And uh, just to show you some numbers and how competitive it has become in the world today, we have a total of 25 Saudi universities in this ranking edition, uh, followed by Egypt, 22. So I think a round of applause to all of you all for making it to uh, the Arab region 22 after Saudi Arabia. So I think you have to clap for yourselves on this one. So, and that number, if you can see here, has improved over the period of time. So 13 universities into 2018. Last year we had 20 and there are 22. So while uh, it is getting competitive, I can say that uh, you know, Egypt is doing good. Uh, it has been, um, Saudi Arabia has been investing a lot as well. There's very tough competition there as well. But I think you're fairly doing fairly good with that and followed by Jordan and UAE there. Um, we can talk about how useful these method, this rankings are, what it does for you, and there's more on the, on the, on the, on the panel. But uh, rankings are definitely not everybody's favorite. So uh, I'll end with a quote from Alison Richard, which says, rankings have many faults and do not adequately describe universities and cannot show whether one institution is better than another. But she's very happy when that institution was ranked as the number one institution. So whoever has seen this slide earlier probably are already aware of that. So thank you so much for this time, and uh, I would like to, we can take questions later, and uh, you know, 10 minutes can only cover this much of fast food, right? So thank you very much, Mr. Ashburn. So if we come to the Times Higher Education, and uh, in the past, both were Times Higher Education and QS were one ranking system. I don't know why they separated or divorced, I don't know. But again, how can you explain uh, uh, Mr. Will Sanchez that uh, a university, like for example the AUC, is 399 in QS, world ranking, and it's over 800 in the Times Higher Education. So how can you compare? If I'm a student, shall I go to the AUC because it is 395, or I will not, I will go to Aswan because it is 400 in the Times Higher Education. So how can I use these they are two, the same ranking from the same, uh, the same uh, UK, uh, <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> so why is the divorce? I asked you before why is the divorce, but uh, this is something you can keep it for yourself. And again, how can I compare? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, uh, to AUC for this invitation. I think the, 
the discussion is going to be very, very interesting after uh, we open it up uh, to the panel uh, and to the uh, guests for discussion. Um, I am Will Sanchez. I'm the regional director for Africa and Latin America for Times Higher Education. And uh, what I'm going to do, since this is going to be a very short uh, and compressed presentation, I'm going to try to touch over the main areas of Times Higher Education, who we are, how do we work, what do we measure, and some new initiatives that we have uh, in the works. Uh, so just quickly uh, to start, um, so who is Times Higher Education? Well, Times Higher Education started in 1971 as a supplement of the Times uh, newspaper in London. So we have been a supplement in this uh, uh, higher education sector for a long, long time, and our reputation is well established, of course, in Europe, but in the last 10 years, we have evolved into uh, more than just a supplement. We are now an independent magazine. We are no longer a part of the Times newspaper. And of course, we are a, a multi-platform uh, uh, publication. We also do rankings. That is not the only thing we do. We also do rankings, and we also do uh, that data. We provide data for global institutions across the globe. Um, so this is who we are. Um, now, what makes us different from any other ranking uh, that is out there? Uh, well, what's one of the areas that makes us different is that we are the only ranking who uh, is fully uh, audited independently by PwC. And this is very, very important for us because uh, we are talking today about quality of education, about quality standards, etc. And as a ranker, for us, it's very important to make sure that our stakeholders, the people who see this ranking, and, and, and related to the question that you make, I am actually able to tell him why his university is ranked, because we have all the data and we uh, promote transparency. All of our methodology is available in our website, uh, as per our request by email, we always make it available for everyone. And, and again, because um, our data is used by governments, by universities, by students, by parents, we know the importance of data. So we try to uh, keep as much quality control as possible, and this is why we subject, sub subject ourselves to this uh, external audit. Now, it's also very important to mention that we also believe that institutions should have a right to say, if they should participate or not in a ranking. So you will see that in our ranking, we have about 1,400 institutions in the last uh, version. Uh, it's the biggest ranking out there. Uh, but there are, of course, not every inst institution that is in other rankings appears with us. And why is that? Simply because of this. We depend on data uh, submission from universities. We need to make sure that the data is the, the updated data directly from the institutions, and this is part of our uh, quality control and methodological process that is audited by PwC. So it is important to mention that. And of course, if a, if a university doesn't want to participate, they should also be free to decide if they want to or not. So a lot of universities participate one year, then they decide not to, and then they decide to participate again because they saw the backlash of not participating in their rankings. Uh, so just quickly going over the methodology. Uh, this is our methodology. These are uh, in the far uh, three uh, spots over there. You will see our sources of data, which is the portal where universities actually report the data. Uh, the second uh, source of information is the student, uh, the, the academic survey, sorry. Uh, and of course, Scopus is our our, our third uh, source of data. So we have three sources of data that will create all of these uh, indicators and will give us as a result five pillars which are our main focus. Citations or the quality of the research being produced, industry income or uh, knowledge transfer, international outlook, research, and teaching. And of course, the thicker the lines, the more value each of these has. Uh, so we can take a look at e each of the areas and how they uh, filter out, which metrics filter into which pillars. So field-weighted citations, this is Elsevier's data. Why do we use Elsevier? We believe they have uh, the biggest database available, the most complete uh, uh, database available for publications in the most number of languages. So that's why we use Elsevier. And they provide uh, this uh, data, and it's equivalent to 30% of the total score. Uh, 
if we take a look at the research pillar, it's made out of uh, three uh, metrics, as you can see there, papers to academic staff ratio, research income to academic staff ratio, and research reputation. Moving along to the teaching pillar, we try to measure as best as possible teaching. Of course, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to really do it uh, adequately, but we're trying to include more uh, metrics to, that might be an indicator of, of teaching quality. So we have doctors to academic staff, doctors to, doctors to bachelor's degree ratio, um, and then we have income to academic staff ratio, a staff to student ratio, and teaching reputation. Of course, this also uh, comes up to 30%, so it's 30, 30, 30. And then we have 2.5 for uh, knowledge transfer or industry income. And of course, we measure this uh, industry income uh, to academic staff ratio. And the last one, uh, international outlook. Of course, we have to measure in how international are the universities. And we use international to domestic staff ratio, international to domestic student ratio, and publications with at least one international author. So another way of looking at the ranking is in a very simple way. You have 30 for teaching, 30 for research, 30 for citations, 7.5 7 for international, and 2.5 for uh, knowledge transfer. And you can see the metrics and each of the weighting that each of the uh, metrics get. So taking a look, we published the latest version of the World University Ranking 2020 uh, last September. Uh, in the top 10, we don't see much movement. Of course, uh, University of Oxford uh, keeps number five. Caltech jumps from five to number two. Cambridge moves to uh, number three. Uh, but it's basically uh, the, sep the same top players. If we quickly take a look at the top 200, we can take a look that we have a different uh, source of countries that are sourcing a, a different number of universities. The United States, uh, from the top 200, has 60 universities. The UK has 28 universities in the top 200. Germany, 23. Australia, 11. Netherlands, 11. And Canada, 7, just to mention some of these. Uh, now, which are the universities that are ranked with us and which belong to the top 4% of the world? These are the 20 universities that rank this year uh, with us. We have to say that over the last two years, uh, Egyptian universities uh, have been included in greater numbers. So two years ago, we only had eight universities ranked with us. And as the uh, distribution extends, we can now include up to 20 universities. And these are all the 20 universities that are ranked with us, uh, which is, is important to mention because uh, they belong to the top 4% of the global institutions, considering there is around 25, 28,000 universities in total. So uh, just being part of the ranking already tells you something about these universities, that talks about research quality, uh, certain standards of quality that are met, and uh, it is important to recognize. Now, the, the placement that they, they have, well, of course, is gonna vary this year, but it's important that uh, we have seen some improvements uh, in terms of the positioning that they are getting in the distribution of the World University Ranking. So congratulations to all of the institutions. Now, what are some of the trends that we can identify at the global level? Well, of course, it's natural to see that we are identifying the rise of Chinese universities in the top uh, 400. So you can see the movement here over the years. Uh, on the left, you can see the Chinese universities, and on the right, you can see the movement of Japanese universities. So we can see the, the trend is going upwards for Chinese institutions uh, in the top 400, and for Japan, it's basically stable or in the lower uh, trend for Japanese institutions. Now, where are the institutions that we cover uh, in the World University Rankings? Well, this is the whole map. It includes all of the 1,400 universities that we have in the ranking. And of course, the color shows the, the different scores. Uh, it's important to mention that from Africa, from the whole continent, Egypt is the, is the best represented country with 20 universities. And then uh, South Africa is the second institution with most represented universities with 10. Uh, 
but of course, we hope that next year we can get at least 25 universities from Egypt and at least 12 or 13 universities from South Africa, and that the number of institutions from other countries in Africa are also included uh, as, time, as time goes by. Uh, so again, uh, if we take a look at new entrants, we can see that uh, most of the new entrants come from Asia, uh, and Africa only got about seven in total uh, for this year's uh, new entrants. Uh, but it's important to, to, to keep uh, you know, asking universities to participate with us because I think um, the ranking really provides uh, a lot of insight on your performance. Maybe not all the metrics are relevant to your institution because it's very hard that for every institution all the metrics are relevant. But just take the ones that you really care about and, and, and use them as benchmarks with institutions that you really think are your competitors or your peers. Uh, you can actually, uh, um, you know, whenever we meet the top universities across the globe, they say, you know, whenever I see a ranking, I don't see competitors in the list. I see future partners, because that's what it should be about. I have to see which universities are already out there doing well and how I can find partnerships with them. So, uh, of course, rankings are, are a very, very useful tool. And, and, of course, I like to invite institutions who are not yet in our ranking to please uh, uh, talk to me after the session or, or, or leave me your details, and I, I can send you all the information. Participation is completely free, and you just need to submit data in the months of January to March, which is our data collection uh, period. So again, um, I'm going to take this uh, into a, a new initiative that we have that we recently published, and it's called uh, our new social impact ranking. And uh, this came up a little bit earlier, uh, how to measure the social impact, how to measure innovation, how to measure uh, different aspects of the university that the world university ranking does not cover. So I'm going to talk quickly about why we're doing this. The objectives with these rankings are to understand uh, how universities are making a positive impact in our world. And we are trying to show the higher education sector uh, that is working towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So how are universities working towards the uh, achieve, achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals? This is something very important, and it's something that is not covered in any other ranking, of course, we try to be as fair as possible uh, across the world. We recognize that we bring our biases into the process, but we are committed uh, to improving the rankings year by year. So what does uh, your participation mean? That means that all universities, no matter if you have research or not, they can join this ranking. Uh, there is an overall ranking of universities based on four SDGs per universities. Uh, and there's also a list for each of the individual SDG rankings. And of course, um, this is the, the inaugural participant batch that universities got. Now I have to mention that from Egypt, out of the 20 universities that are ranked in the World University ranking, 60 un 16 universities participated in the first pilot for um, the impact ranking, which is outstanding. It's, it's really something to recognize about the universities because they really want to show the world what their impact is across the globe in the different uh, SDGs. Um, so how do we try to make it fair and how is this different than the other ranking? Well, there's no entry criteria. The World University ranking, as you might know, has some uh, entry criteria, which is basically uh, research. That's the hardest uh, criteria to meet, which you need 1,000 papers in a period of five years. And then you also need to teach undergrad uh, uh, also. Um, and, and graduate school. Uh, so this is definitely different and this creates an opportunities for those universities who are doing uh, a positive impact out there in society but are not able to meet uh, you know, the threshold for research or that's not the nature of the university. They just don't do research. So how can we measure those universities? This is one of the ways. Um, we, of course, have listened to input from universities, organizations, and individuals. We publish each, each of the SDGs, not just overall score, and um, we do banding to reflect uh, uncertainty. But of course, this year, on, during the pilot, we only included 12 of the first uh, 17 SDGs. 
Now in the next version, we are gonna include the 17 SDGs. So now we have metrics for all of the SDGs. And if you are interested in participating with us, you can actually start submitting data uh, from this month until January. So if you have not uh, have the information, please just approach me after the session. Uh, again, uh, just to see what results came out and how much, how much uh, participation we got from across the globe. So you can see that uh, here the picture changes because we didn't get as much participation from North America, uh, uh, maybe because they thought it was hard for them to uh, perform well in this uh, ranking. Definitely a lot of participation from uh, Europe and Asia, Australasia. Uh, but more importantly, emerging markets, emerging economies are there and they are working uh, hard to uh, have good results in this ranking. We got 61 universities from Latin America and 35 universities from the whole continent of Africa. And out of those 35, 16 are from Egypt, just to mention. So almost half of the universities that reported data in this first pilot are from Egypt, which is amazing and, and something to recognize uh, uh, about uh, the Egyptian institutions. So again, uh, I hope this gives you a better overview that rankings, of course, uh, the World University rankings are focused on research and they do uh, a lot of different things for different universities, but we also are working in different initiatives that can measure other things about universities. And I think this is gonna bring something else to the discussion. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I tried to give you a brief summary of what THE is, and uh, let's keep the discussion going on the panel afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Will. And now we will have uh, the impact of uh, Elsevier, and Elsevier is uh, the well-known uh, publisher, and uh, it is the main uh, uh, backbone of the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. So we'll see how it can help both in ranking and even accreditation. And we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Yahya Isa, please. Okay. Good, af <coughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Asher. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to be here uh, back home. I am an AUC graduate. So. <laughs> uh, and today I'll be talking about the role of uh, Elsevier with respect to ranking organizations. Um, so just some background on why rankings could be so important. We have uh, testimonies like we've heard from our colleagues uh, at THNQS that uh, students actually look at rankings uh, especially international students when they are selecting universities, so this could be a factor on why uh, a university wants to be ranked. And we also have uh, testimonies from some politicians uh, uh, say, saying why they are interested in ranking. In general, I would agree with the, some of my colleagues that uh, ranking should not be a goal, rather it's a byproduct if we have a good university with an academic and research ecosystem then ranking will come by itself. We don't have to chase it. But on the other hand, the decision makers will, will look at it because it's a way to measure the quality of their institutes. I've heard Dr. Khaled, uh, His Highness Dr. Khaled Abdul Ghaffar before say, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So it's a, it's a balance which uh, we need to keep. So today I'll be mainly talking about our role, Elsevier's role, with respect to some of the ranking organizations and some recommendations to universities on what they can do to measure their performance and maybe plan for the future to improve their ranking. So here are some of the sample uh, ranking agencies which are using the data from Scopus specifically. So of course we have uh, QS, Times Higher Education, uh, NERF, I believe, is, uh, is specific to Indian institutions, Maclean's to Canadian institutions, the one in yellow to Polish institutions, Financial Times is specific to business schools, as we've heard in the AM session, 
and also this IMAGO institution rankings. Uh, most of these organizations, they're actually taking the data and using it themselves. So they are taking the Scopus data and using them themselves, except for THE where we have uh, a more, uh, more of a partnership. We process some of the, the data on their behalf, but at the end of the day, it's their methodology and they come up with the methodology. So if we go into some details about times higher education. So here we have the number of institutes during the past four years ranked in times higher, times higher world university rankings in Africa. And uh, we see that Egypt, we are on the rise, and we are currently at 20. After, uh, uh, the second country is uh, South Africa, who are now uh, at 10. 2020, they are at uh, 10 universities, and so on. But in general, there is an increase in the number of universities ranked, uh, in the number of African universities ranked in Times Higher Education World University rankings. A brief on the minimum requirements in order to be ranked. So, as my colleague, uh, Mr. Well said, the, the university needs to apply to the ranking in order to be considered because maybe the university does not want to even to apply. Uh, you need 1,000 papers during the past five year window. By past five years, we mean that in Times Higher Education 2020, which was released in September 2019, they were covering the five full years 2014 until 2018. So you need 1,000 publications during these uh, period, 1,000 publications in journals indexed in Scopus, to be more specific, and you need at least 150 papers per year. So even if you're meeting the 1,000 paper threshold, each year you cannot be less than 150 papers. And maybe not, me, not many people know this, is that documents from discontinued titles are not counted. So if a publication was published in a journal which is indexed in Scopus, and for any reason or another, that journal is removed from Scopus, then that's not considered in the ranking. So we need to keep that in mind because we had a, a case with Aswan University not, who are now uh, in the top 500 universities in Egypt. But last year, the, one of the years, they, they had exactly 150 papers. So when you remove the discontinued titles, they're not meeting the requirements anymore. So that's why they, they were not showing up in, in THE 2019, but then when they showed up in THE 2020, they are in fact on the top of the country in the Times Higher Education ranking, them and Montsora University, of course, uh, and a variable threshold per subject area. If you want to be ranked in the different subject areas, so, uh, Swan and Montsora University are in the five, 401 to 500 uh, uh, Montsora, yes. right? <laughs> okay, so uh, my colleague also already showed the slide. Uh, so I'm just showing, I'm just showing what are the data Elsevier is uh, providing within this context. So we have the citations, which are represented by the field weighted citation impact, which is uh, a measure directly uh, extracted from uh, the Scopus database. International collaboration. So papers with at least one author from a foreign country. Research productivity, which is normalized by the number of uh, researchers at the institute. So this, I think, somehow answers your question, Dr. Ashraf, on comparing different sized institutions is by using normalized metrics. So we're not looking at the scholarly output as an absolute value, rather it's normalized by the number of research, full-time researchers at the institute. Uh, and the ones in DASHT, although they are not uh, Scopes data, we run the reputation surveys for the teaching and research on behalf of Times Higher Education. So this is how Elsevier is, uh, is uh, assisting or helping or partnering with Times Higher Education with regards, with regards to the World University Rankings. With regards to QS, they normally are the ones, they take the data and they manage their own data processing. So it's not the same partnership we have with THE. Uh, for the world university rankings, 20% of the weight is on the citations per faculty. And it's uh, in this criteria where they are using the Scopus data. So they use the publications for a five year window and the citations for a six year window, if I'm not mistaken. So for the, for the most recent uh, ranking, they were using the publications from 2013 until 2017 and the citations from 2013 until 2018. So just a quick example of how Scopus data is prepared for time higher education. In this case, we're using the example of uh, 2018. 
So in 2018, they were actually looking at the five years, 2016, 2012 until 2016. So at the time, all of the Scopes database had 60, 67 million uh, index, indexed documents. During this time period, they were around 14 million. We only select the, the documents which are considered in the ranking, including the articles, review articles, conference proceedings, books, and book chapters. So the number goes down to 12.7 million. And then we remove the uh, documents from the suspended or discontinued titles. So we go down to 12.3 uh, million. And then they are subdivided into their different uh, document types and the different subject areas. So just a uh, quick, uh, some quick numbers on the data we are providing uh, for the World University Rankings. Now to the more interesting uh, part, it's about some recommendations. So how can, um, how can Elsevier assist universities uh, or higher education institutes uh, in improving their ranking? So for starters, we can assist with the affiliation corrections. We've seen that uh, in many institutions here in Egypt where the, you have many different name formats for the same institute, so not, every, not everything is showing under one profile. So we can help with that. Uh, we've already had a big project uh, during the past two, three years of affiliation correction for most institutes in Egypt. But if anyone still has a problem with that, they can always uh, contact with us. Uh, support to increase journals' visibility. So we provide workshops on how to include, if you have local journals in the, in the university, how can you index them in Scopus? for increased visibility for your work, and this will in turn uh, support your uh, ranking. And understand the research metrics and plan for improvement. So if we take a simple example of here, since we're at the American University in Cairo, so you can see that uh, during the past five years, here's a summary of the research performance of AUC, our scholarly output, we also have our scholarly output year on year. So by looking at these, you can look at your trends. Uh, are we publishing more or less uh, during the past five years? What are our trends? Basically, it's about where are we and where do we need to go from here? But where do we need to go? It's easier to know how you want to reach where you want to reach by knowing where you, are, you, where you, are, where you actually are. Also, of course, the field-weighted citation impact and uh, so on. Collaboration. Uh, you can see uh, the percentage of papers you, you, you have published with international collaboration, national collaboration, institutional collaboration, and single authorship. So it's basically a way to make evidence-based decisions. For AUC, we see that 40% of their papers have international collaboration. And this is the general case we see is that papers with international collaboration have a higher field-weighted citation impact than those with national collaboration, than those with institutional collaboration. So it's a way to support to make evidence-based decisions. Know who you are collaborating with and if they are successful, or if these collaborations are successful or not. By successful or not, we mean that we see who we are collaborating with and we see uh, the field-weighted citation impact of this collaboration. Normally, if it's higher than our own field-weighted citation impact, then we can call it a successful collaboration. If it's lower, then we can say it's uh, maybe not so successful collaboration. So in a way here, you'll see that we have some institutions where we collaborate with. We have a field weight citation impact 1.3, 1.5. On the other hand, we have others where when we collaborate with them, we have a field weight citation impact of 0.67. One is our benchmark, so 0.67 is like 33% below the world average. AUC in general is at 0.95 currently during the, these five years, 2014 until 2018. Of course, you can also know which topics the institute is working on and you can evaluate the performance of each topic to know if this is a topic I want to continue working on or not. Of course, us as researchers or as decision makers at the university, we want to, to, uh, how do I say, to recommend or uh, that our researchers work on trending topics. When we work on trending topics, it's easier to publish in them because the world is interested in them. It's easier to, to get funding for them because the funding agencies are interested in them. When we do publish in them, it's easier to have, uh, we have a better possibility of having more citations because the world is interested in them and so on. So it's a benefit. So we can assist the higher education institutions by knowing which, which topics to work on and which not. We do not tell you which one to work on, but we can tell you the trend of the topic, the prominence of the topic, 
And we also assist you in answering some of the questions like, who are the top institutions working on this very specific topic, uh, top countries? So this could be helpful if, you, if the institute wants to sign, for example, an MOU or something in a specific topic. You can know who do you want to sign with. If I'm a researcher, I can know who, do, who are the authors working on this topic if I want to find collaborators on a very specific topic and where to publish, of course. So if I'm working on a very specific topic, we can have the list of publishers. And finally, we get down to the increasing of the visibility of journals by, by indexing them in Scopus. Uh, we, we provide workshops showing the criteria the, that must be met in order for a journal to be indexed in Scopus, how to apply. And we have a very recent success uh, story from here at AUC where the journal Arab Media and Society uh, applied. We showed them the, the way how to apply and they did apply and now it's indexed in Scopus. So it's a bilingual journal, so this is very important. It publishes in both Arabic and English and uh, it's currently uh, indexed in Scopus. The publisher is here, AUC. So just a point that uh, Scopus currently covers uh, 40 different languages, so it's not strict to English language uh, publications. Arabic language journals could be published as well as long as they meet the criteria. And we can show you what the criteria are and how to apply to have your local journals indexed in Scopus. So just some of our uh, a wrap up of the recommendations. Following your research performance, identifying your areas of strengths and areas of weaknesses to address them accordingly. Identify the trending topics to focus on, maybe make funds available to them, pursue evidence-based collaborations, and always use a basket of metrics. By a basket of metrics, we mean when we are assessing an entity, we look at it from different dimensions and not just from one dimension. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yahya. And uh, the floor now is open for uh, discussion, comments, questions. Dr. Mohtes. Mr. Bilesh, innovation. I believe the ranking is very important incentive for universities to look at it, to compare their performance with other universities worldwide, and this is an important thing. It's not the main thing, uh, but, but it is very useful. Uh, uh, let me give, uh, the issue is here is weights and selection of these weights in, in uh, evaluating universities. If we took the QS, excuse me to, to intervene in your uh, special work, we have, we have about 50% for education and administration, and we have only 20% for research and internationalization about 10%, something like that. And for Shanghai, we can find 60% for research and 30% for price gated by alumni or by... So there is a big, there is large difference between the weights allocated to the uh, institutional performance of universities. Here there is a problem for evaluating. I thought in the beginning that we can, we can think about several ranking and compare them, but I, I feel that this difference in ranking and orientation affect to a great extent our decision to follow one of them or others. Uh, 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 and let me back that now to the weights. And it's very important for us, or for someone, to select on, on what basis weights are. There is a difference of weights. This is an indicator. You are giving each country an indicator, one indicator. And this indicator is affected by the weights of each of these ranking. And it should be clear why we selected these weights, why we are giving 60% to research. Are we dealing with an era with the research universities so they are increasing the, the shares to 60%? Or we think like times that education is very important, should continue to be important, so we are giving 50% to education and so on. So the weight should be clear, the selection of the weights and the impact on the ranking for each uh, university in that case. And I think it's very useful statistical exercise to do it. Believe me, if you do sensitivity analysis, things, uh, in the way of statistician, that if you change the weight and see, and see the ranking goes where? If there is a change in weights, does, does the ranking change or not? D 
the, this way you will be sure that you have your, show, your ranking is robust in statistical things. But this way, it's very difficult to follow. The second, can I, uh, yes. Um, and I feel that uh, uh, I appreciate very much in times uh, high education, the, 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 the estimate of industry research uh, indicator. And I think this is a very indicator. And we, uh, we miss, this is very important for the Arab countries, for our area, that our research reaches industry and the society. And, and we need to know on what basis it, it is estimated. The second thing is that I, I feel a domination of high and upper middle income countries in times in the, in, as, as you presented, in, in, in being ranked better than other universities. Did you study this relation? Is, is the income the important thing? High income is important because expenditure on higher education is uh, affect to a great extent this ranking or not. The last point is that I would appreciate it very much. We would like to see the outcome of your research. And if you can give us some points about how to introduce social impact, innovation, and SDGs in your estimate while ranking university. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Anna? Uh, thank you very much for very nice presentations. I have a question for Mr. Yahya. Uh, I have been looking for a list of uh, Arabic journals uh, which are uh, in Scopus.index. Uh, can you provide me this list or for the audience who are looking for, because our faculty who are publishing in uh, Arabic journals, they find it very hard to get this list of journals. Um. Anna, Dr. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. But uh, our colleagues in the social science uh, discipline say that not uh, most of their uh, papers are not uh, Scopus indexed. So how would we solve this problem for ranking and uh, accreditation? La not Arabic. Uh, yeah, not. I'm saying about English. Hat. There is a problem in social science publications. Thank you. Okay. Waraki. Uh, if, uh, if people um, uh, um, have uh, published their papers uh, in journals that are indexed in, uh, in uh, the web of science or in, uh, in other in indices, would they still show on, uh, on uh, Elsevier and Scopus, I, if they have profiles on Orcade, would this sort this problem? Or should they, if they are targeting uh, times higher education, they should be indexed in, in Scopus only? And if they target QS, where, where would they go? Where would, where would their uh, publications be visible? Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, and, and, and. Uh, Nair Al Isnawi, Vice Dean of uh, Engineering at Badr University in Cairo. Uh, my question first I'd like to thank Ashwin for stressing the fact that uh, uh, accreditation is meeting the standards, while ranking is the effectiveness of application of these standards, if there are a commonality between both of them. But, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ashraf Hatem asked the question, I, did, I didn't find an answer to it. Why there is a large difference sometimes in ranking uh, from different uh, uh, institutions? I know that you have different uh, uh, metrics for rankings, but the difference sometimes is really large. For accreditation, uh, Dr. Johansson said that uh, she stresses on the mission of the uh, institution and how the mission is being achieved to determine whether it should be guaranteed a, 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 a accreditation or not. My question for the rankers. Uh, you have different metrics, but you did not mention the ultimate target that you need to achieve. Am I a good university or am I a bad university? Not, not a, not, not a well-ranked university, but what is the target? You have like five metrics, uh, and each metrics have some metrics for it, but what is the, the, the ultimate goal? 
is it the educational service that you are offering, or is it the research service that you are offering, or is it the community service that you are offering? This is not clear to me. And again, uh, I need a, a comment about why uh, sometimes the ranking for the same university is different between different rankers. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? So we can uh, um, answering or commenting or <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, I will take the last question first, because that was, that was also asked by Dr. Ashraf. Is a large difference between different ranking systems, and I think I've been made I've made very clear in the beginning that our ranking system was designed for students. And the methodology, and as it's connected to another point uh, right in front here, is the methodology being 40% and 60% and whatever percentage. So our methodology was developed keeping students in mind, and that is why the methodology it's in itself has been made clear and has been made comprehensible so that it appeals to students. Now, while I say that, there are other audiences as well. Like we are, I'm talking to a group of academics here who are interested in rankings as well. But that's not the primary audience for QS. The primary audience for producing our rankings has been prospective international students. And while we are talking to you, we do realize you do use the rankings to see how do you perform, how do you compare, how do you benchmark. But that's why when we are producing these rankings, it's on a broad-based level. Uh, not just looking at research, but also looking at reputation, looking at a proxy for teaching to a faculty-student ratio as well. And that's why uh, what we produce might be different from what Shanghai Jiao Tong or THA produce, because in Shanghai, it's purely a uh, you know, research uh, based league table where you're looking at field medalists and Nobel laureates and so on and I think uh, you know you can uh, I think THE will, will answer from their side on where is the other thing but definitely for us it is the students at the heart of what we do. Um, the point about the methodology and weights which you did mention sir is that uh, the weights are definitely different for different methodologies and different ranking providers but for us when we started off the ranking in 2004 uh, that's a time when we decided well, this is some basic things put together we formed an international academic advisory board which has presidents of universities around the world uh, which meet once a year and we do open up these discussions to them to see what do we do how do we do make it better and there's definitely points taken and uh, discussions being held for the arab region ranking which was introduced in 2015 the discussion was what is relevant to the region and not just as a minimum level, but how do you aspire institutions to do better as well? Because you don't want to have a criteria which just is status quo, and doesn't aspire institutions to do better. So when we had the first iteration in 2015, it was great, 50 institutions, everybody very happy, then we said, well, how do we raise the bar? How do we make institutions in the region do better? And in 2019, uh, 2018, last year, we introduced two new indicators inside. So what we, uh, what, to the, one of the indicator is international research network. And definitely collaboration has been one of the main challenges in this region, even within the Arab region as well. So we are now looking at how do institutions collaborate, not just, uh, you know, from here in Malaysia or here in the U.S., which are the hot spots, but also within the region. How do you collaborate with the UAE? How do you collaborate with uh, Jordan and uh, Lebanon and other countries? So that's also accounted for, and it's a process where we believe our interaction with you. I mean, I'm in the region so often talking to all of you all, and I think the kind of time I spend in the region is more than what I spend at home. So that's the kind of importance we believe we have, especially at my role, to understand what you want and how can we deliver better, not just keeping you in mind, but keeping the students in mind as well. Uh, Scopus was another point which was mentioned, and I think both the ranking agencies here today use Scopus, so definitely it is uh, one of the preferred uh, databases, and I, I think um, uh, people ask why Scopus and why not Web of Science, and I think uh, Scopus are definitely much more friendlier to work with than, uh, than Web of Science could be one of the uh, reasons. But besides that, it does cover a larger subjects, uh, larger 
representation of different faculties and different subjects. And I think when we're looking at arts and humanities and social sciences and uh, other areas where uh, web of science is not very strong in, I think that's what gives everybody an opportunity to get featured in the ranking, in the QS ranking at least. And we use something called a faculty and normalization. So if you produce anything in arts and humanities, which is indexed in Scopus, we amplified by almost 15 times. Uh, so that means we, we actually enhance the work of humanities which is happening in research. So giving institutions an opportunity to actually publish more and encourage uh, their faculty to publish more in humanities as well. And I think I really like the fact that, and uh, you know, I definitely want to have a discussion with, uh, uh, with Yahya on Arabic uh, journals. How can we get more of them indexed? And that's the biggest challenge in this region. And I think I know the Arab Association of Universities is working on something. I'm not sure how far that has gone, but definitely is required, uh, we, but before even that happens over five years, we need to have more Arabic journals indexed inside, so there should be a clear process. I think every time I get asked this question when I present is, how can we get our journal indexed? And I said, well, contact Elsevier, there is Wail in Dubai and, uh, and Amr in Egypt, so you can definitely speak to them, but I know Amr is not there, but definitely some clear, clear cut uh, instructions would definitely help everyone. So I think I've answered most of, uh, most of that, uh, so over to. Uh, touching on industry um, or knowledge transfer or um, the resources that universities uh, get from industry, uh, for us it is a very, very important factor, uh, especially in emerging economies, because universities in emerging economies have, in a big way, uh, a dependency on government funds. And what we have seen is as universities start to get more resources from the private sector, they are able to fund many, many projects that they will not be able to fund otherwise. Because, uh, for example, I can tell you the perfect example of Latin America. Every year in Latin America, the governments are cutting the uh, funds for education. No matter, uh, you know, higher education, middle education, uh, every, every sector of education gets their budgets cut. So universities are saying, how, are, how can we innovate? How can we work if we don't have any other source of funds? So definitely this is a very important uh, metric for us. And uh, in the ranking, I couldn't show the slide because I had to cut the presentation a lot for, for, to meet the time standard. But um, um, I had some information on the results of the... Uh, the impact ranking on innovation, because there is an SDG for innovation. And what it's showing is we don't have a top 10 university from the US or Europe in the top 10. We have Asian universities in the top 10. Why? Because they are the universities who are getting the most resources from the private industry. They are creating more companies within the universities as, as spin-offs, and they are registering more patents than anyone else in the world. So our number one university for innovation is, um, is KAIST in Korea, uh, which is something that nobody really thinks about. Everybody thinks, oh, it must be Harvard or it must be one of the top universities. Well, the data shows a different story, and we need to start taking a look at that because, again, in emerging economies, it presents a huge opportunity for universities to fund a lot of, lot of things within the university, a lot of research projects, a lot of social projects that otherwise would be hard to, to fund. So uh, definitely it is very, very important uh, for us to mention this. Uh, in terms of the metrics and how do we decide um, which metrics to select, we are always consulting uh, with the higher education sector. In fact, just last September we had the World Academic Summit in Zurich with ETH Zurich. We had about 350 or 400 academics there, most of them senior level university presidents from all over the world, not, not only Europe. Uh, and uh, we are basically already looking at the ranking and, and thinking how can we improve because we know it's not perfect. We know things have to change at some point and things have to, you know, as the higher, in this, in, higher education sector evolves, we also need to evolve as a ranker. So that's why we are creating new initiatives with new metrics like the social impact ranking. And also, I think that there is also an area of opportunity because 
as we have mentioned before, there is no perfect ranking. Every ranking has its flaws. Every ranking has, you know, something that doesn't fit to every university. You know, the metrics might not fit for every university. But we believe that we can improve it, and that's why we constantly uh, consult with the higher education sector. And this includes academics from all over the world. Uh, we do it, uh, we have about eight events every year um, all across the globe, and we take these opportunities to meet the leaders uh, of the universities and consult with them about, you know, the metrics, what can we improve as a ranker. So uh, hopefully um, all of these consultations uh, we'll show some results in the next couple of years when we will show maybe uh, a couple of changes in our methodology. Yeah. Dr. Thank you. Okay, so I had three questions. So the first question, well, basically we would recommend that uh, the journals publishing in Arabic to prepare themselves to be indexed in Scopus by meeting the criteria. What are the criteria? I can go through the main ones, but in any case, you can always reach out to us uh, to give you the full list of criteria. Basically, they need a convincing editorial board uh, and editorial policy. They need to have some online presence, as in an online homepage with the archives available, and so on. Uh, they need to translate the title, author names, abstract, and references in English. The full text does not need to be translated, but those need to be translated. Of course, it needs to be peer-reviewed. There has to be some geographical diversity in the authors and in the editors of the journal. Uh, it's the editorial board or the editor-in-chief which takes the step to, to, to apply, to say, I want, I want this journal to be indexed in Scopus. Who makes the decision? In fact, it's not Elsevier that makes the decision. We have a content selection. Uh, content selection on advisory board, which is made up of 17 independent experts representing different subject areas. They're the ones who make the decision whether this journal meets the requirements to be indexed in Scopus or not. So, it's, uh, so there is no bias from Elsevier's part on what <coughs> is indexed in Scopus and what is not. And it's a free process. So you do not uh, pay anything in this process. You do not need to be subscribed to Scopus to apply. So it's uh, basically if you meet the criteria, we advise you to apply. If you don't, we advise you to wait until you meet, do meet the criteria and, and then apply. Like I said in my presentation, we have a very nice uh, success story from here at AUC. Uh, so they applied this past year, and they have now the Arab Media and Society Journal Index and Scopus since 2018. Uh, and it's a bilingual journal, so it's publishing both in Arabic and English. So, uh, Regarding the second question about uh, the, okay, let me go to the third question. Uh, I'll go to the third question because he's on the phone. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I remember the question, but as he's talking on the phone, let's go to the third question and we'll come back. <laughs> okay, so uh, regarding the web of science, so uh, normally, or 99% of the cases, the journals which are Included in Web of, Web of Science will be included in Scopus as well. Okay, uh, so the journal could be, of course, in, indexed in many different databases. Uh, the ideal researcher will check where it, uh, the journal is indexed before publishing uh, or before submitting a paper to it. But uh, yeah, so Scopus almost has double the the, the number of journals than Web of Science, uh, but. Almost 99% of the journals in Web of Science are already indexed in Scopus. Uh, now, regarding the question about uh, the social science presence in Scopus, we were not here talking about Arabic, we were talking about even English. Actually, uh, 20, uh, more than a quarter of the journals indexed in Scopus are in the social sciences. And the AKB has very generously provided national access to Scopus to all the Egyptian institutes. Uh, so actually, any researcher on Scopus could just go down to the sources and filter them by the subject area, and they'll have the full list of the journals publishing in the social sciences. They can even go down to sub subject subjects, but uh, yeah, it's it's actually it's a myth. Uh, more than 25, more than quarter of the journals indexed in Scopus are in the social sciences. Okay. We, we must close, but Sani, you can come in. I'm arts and humanities, and one of the biggest challenges we face as academics is that um, as we publish our research, 
It is not indexed under Scopus. The journals are not under Scopus. And hence, um, we're not, even though we're publishing, um, our research is not contributing um, to the number of publications that will help our university um, you know, uh, you know, be uh, considered for ranking. So to say that it's under, uh, two of you now have just said that no, it, you know, this is, uh, Scopus has a wider scope. No, the arts and humanities and the social sciences, unless it is psychology or linguistics. Yes, some of the journals are listed, however, <coughs> literature and, um, and other areas are not, and this is really a problem for us um, as private universities and those of the arts are trying to publish in that area and help our universities reach the number of uh, publications for international grants. Okay, I, I hear your concern, but actually, um, if I want to publish in a journal index and Scopus, I would start at the Scopus database and see what are the journals index and Scopus, and not publish in a journal, and then say, okay, this journal is it not and is not indexed in Scopus. Well, you did not check in the first place. So it's it's actually your choice uh, what, where you want to publish. <laughs> Um, okay, I could agree with you on some of the sub subject areas. Maybe arts and humanities is also a big umbrella with many different specialties underneath. I'm not uh, aware of the number of journals within each of those sub specialty, but as a general subject area, it accounts for a quarter of the uh, output. Now, in recommending to us to increase, in fact, we have no control of. Uh, which journals are in Scopus and what are their subject areas. It's actually the journals, like we said, which say we have a journal which is meeting your requirements and we want it to be indexed in Scopus. And the decision is not made by Elsevier. It's an independent board which makes the decision. So in fact, we have no say on that. And it's the journal which says which subject areas they fall under. So it's, it's not up to us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> no, they, they are speaking about social sciences, yeah. Mesh Mesh Bessa Arabi. Yeah. Okay. Okay, of course. But Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the distinguished uh, panelists. And uh, now for uh, the closing remarks and recommendations, we have the, uh, Mr. Timothy Muscon and uh, Provost Tehab Abdurrahman. Please come to the uh, to the. Um, if you, if we may, please go back to our seats for our concluding remarks.
Yes, if we may please um, go back. And then we will, uh, after the concluding remarks, we'll have plenty of time for networking. Okay, um, good afternoon. And um, once again, I would like to thank you for being with us today. Uh, EUC is uh, very proud to have you with us today. Uh, I truly believe this uh, topic, uh, accreditation, or ranking, uh, we need more discussion about that in order to come up actually with more concrete con uh, conclusions about uh, uh, that issue. So let me summarize what happened in the day, and before I do that, I would like to thank the team who has helped actually in putting that uh, summary together, Iman Megahed again, and her team. So thank you, Iman, thank you very much. So we discussed the importance of accreditation uh, during the accreditation panel with our esteemed panelists, and the importance of accreditation is clear. Dr. Timothy mentioned that accreditation focuses on high quality and continuous improvement through an internal self-assessment. It is mission-driven, ensures the graduates meet their institutional learning outcomes, ensures a specific quality of education. Accredited institutions become a part of an elite group with a mark of excellence. Uh, our colleague, Dr. Mosto from the Middle States, stated that accreditation compares an institution with international standards, allows an institution to distinguish areas of improvement and work on developing solutions. Not only that, but an accredited institution gives students some assurance of receiving a quality education and gaining recognition by other colleges and by employers. However, Accreditation is also a very challenging process. Dr. Johansson stated international accreditation is demanding both financially and academically, in addition to cultural barriers and many other challenges. So how can a university prepare for accreditation? One, make sure that the institution is eligible for international slash national or institutional school program accreditation you're seeking. Prepare for accreditation through an internal assessment process involving different stakeholders, I would say all stakeholders from the community. Ensure you have a clear strategy to ensure well-aligned institutional directions. Compare experiences and good accreditation practices with other universities. That's why, as Dr. Sharif Ali mentioned in his comments, most accreditors are volunteers because the accreditation process is beneficial on its own as it helps them learn how the university operates and help them gain expertise to take back to their own universities. Ranking. To summarize the ranking pa uh, panel, Mr. Ashwin Fernandez and Mr. Will Sanchez both discussed the importance of ranking and the indicators for both QS and Times Higher Education. As Mr. Ashwin mentioned, the highest weighted indicator in QS ranking are the academic and employer repetitions. This has worked in many institutions worldwide as well as for AUC. He also mentioned that one of the main benefits is that rankings are not financially challenging as it is a public service. Mr. Will Sanchez mentioned that Times Higher Education indicators also focus on research, but is now trying to include more metrics to measure quality of teaching, which might be challenging. The Times Higher Education is also working on including more indicators to measure the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Elsevier, and thanks to Dr. Yahya Isa, who's our alumni, he mentioned during the panel that the biggest database for research is Elsevier, mentioned some of the minimum requirements in order to be ranked as a as uh, ranked such as 1,000 papers for the five years window, at least 150 paper per year, among others. So um, ranking in general have a strong potential in defining the strategic direction of any university based on the metrics and informed decision. And I'm not really sure if we should allow ranking to lead the strategic de decision of the university or we should we allow the, de the strategic decision and direction of the university lead the ranking, the ranking we should follow afterwards. Uh, my own opinion, actually, the university should focus on its own business and ranking should follow afterwards. That's my own opinion. However, for ranking to be positioned this way, we need to look at the criteria used to whether they match the nature of our region, our institutions, and their missions. It's issues such as 
the percentage of allocated, uh, the weight of research uh, on the results, the criteria used to assess teaching is very limited, proxy, students to faculty ratio. A big bulk of ranking is based on repetition surveys, which have their merits, but also their huge bias. So we are proposing or in need of a more balanced ranking mechanism that focuses equally on three pillars any institution in higher education needs to be focusing on teaching, employment, and research. Review the proxies used and expand on them using standard higher education definitions and metrics such as completion rate, selectivity, satisfaction surveys, and others. Finally, there is a benefit to both accreditation and rankings, as both can help an institution as both can help an institution achieve its mission and main goal, which ensuring quality education for our students. Before I end, actually, by my last statement, I, as an, someone who's been in the higher education business for uh, decades and working both in the United States and Egypt, I can uh, just assure you that quality has no finish line, and we keep that in mind. Quality has no finish line. Ranking, accreditation, we should focus on continuous improvement of what we do, and that's what will take us where we want to be. So let me finish by what can we do uh, for our colleagues uh, in Egypt. EC hopes to lead efforts within the region regarding ensuring excellence of education and would love to provide any expertise we have to help any university seeking accreditation or seeking to improve their ranking. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, colleagues here at AUC again for this incredibly engaging uh, day-long opportunity. Um, I know at, at many, many of our conferences, the most attended sessions are those that deal with rankings. Though our organization, AACSB, not involved in rankings at all, when we invite colleagues from QS, Times Higher Ed, and usually the FT and the Economist, the rooms are packed because everybody wants to hear and everybody's sitting on the edge of their chair and seeing how can they, how can they gain some kind of competitive advantage. With that said, I want to agree with the provost. I think as university leadership, and this is my 40th year in higher ed, I'm, I'm the old one here, and that was many, many years as a, as a professor, 21 years as a dean, and almost seven years as a university president. It all starts with universities making a strategic decision. That decision usually drives what I call an inductive strategy, starting with discipline, excellence. And whether that discipline is one of the many that's touched by ABET, or whether that discipline is like our focus at AECSB on business and economics, or any of the other international accreditors touching discipline-specific excellence, that's generally where universities begin this internationalization odyssey. It's around benchmarking with the best at the discipline level worldwide. Why? To increase your own student mobility, to increase international visibility and recognition, to attract professional staff and professors globally, and to raise the awareness of the institution discipline by discipline in a global audience. And so that's the focus on the discipline-based accreditation. It's very interesting because ACSB and ABED are, 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 uh, are, are sort of uh, uh, accreditation twins in different disciplines. We both accredit close to 870 to 900 institutions worldwide, representing thousands of degree pro programs at bachelor's masters and doctoral levels. So after all these years, we've, we're sort of almost essentially um, the, same, the same size. 
Today, as I mentioned, AACSB accredits institutions in 56 countries. And this is a dramatic shift for us that didn't happen until the last 30 years. As we acknowledged in that universe of 16,000 business schools, that there can be excellence in a variety of locations, in a variety of countries worldwide, that's defined uh, on a regionally specific level. So a couple of other points, because there's a lot of talk about research, and usually when fingers are pointed at AECSB, it's about our demands for high research levels. Interestingly, we are agnostic both about the language of instruction as well as the language of the journal. For us, it is none of our business to demand an institution teach in a single language. It is quite acceptable if you choose to teach in Portuguese or in Spanish or in Swahili, whatever that might be, that's the institution's business. Likewise, our institutions define for us quality journals, quality peer-reviewed publications, regardless of the language or, or the, the, the international platform uh, that's presumed to be the best. We allow, our German institutions have their own journal rankings. The Australian business deans have an extraordinary journal rankings. In the UK, the Chartered, uh, the Chartered Association of Business Schools has their own journal rankings. ESSEC in Sergi in France has their own journal rankings. Each is perfectly acceptable within their own context. And I think that's something that's very, very important. My last two points. We have a new keen focus, and this came up over and over again, not just on outcomes, but on impact. And we ask everyone to think about telling the story of the impact of your successes. In many cases, in the, in the journal world, that may be a, by citation indices, and there may be a quantitative count. On the other hand, it may involve simply storytelling on the part of the institution that says this was an impactful program and why. And finally, in April of 2020, AECSB will introduce and our members will vote on our new standards. You saw today I talked about 15 standards in April of 2020 that's been recast and our members will vote on nine standards. Now where I sit, that's a huge improvement because only 10 years ago we had 21 standards. So we're moving in the right direction because less is better. But of those nine, there was great discussion today around the SDGs and social engagement. We will finally have a standard that's a wraparound standard related to social impact, social engagement, and your ability to successfully address those sustainable development goals that are relevant to your school, in your location, in your country. I think that's a good thing, that after 103 years, our standards can continue to evolve and change as the market changes. So thank you again for the invitation to be here today. Thank you for your commitment to excellence. However you define that, I would encourage you to look at accreditation as a pathway to international quality assurance and leverage that success in the context of rankings at some point. So Mr. Provost, thank you for the quality of AUC and everything that's done here, and thank you all for your attention today. Very, very much.